Bike tyres can be pretty confusing, so I'm going to explain everything that you need to know, including some stuff that I think even the most experienced of cyclists are going to be amazed by. This is a deep dive into the world of bike tyres. If this and other bike tech nerdy stuff sounds like your sort of thing, well, subscribe to GCN Tech and turn on your notifications. So. Ever since the invention of the bicycle in 1817, there's been the need for a tyre on a wheel. Early versions of so-called tyres were metal bands fitted around wooden wheels and provided very little grip and were pretty uncomfortable to ride on. While most of us will take the fact we have pneumatic tyres for granted, it wasn't until 1887 when John Boy Dunlop created the first pneumatic tyre to improve the comfort for his son's bike. Oh, and if you didn't pay attention in science class at school, pneumatic just means air-filled. Using a pneumatic tyre compared to a solid one also greatly reduces the rolling resistance of our bike tyres, helping your wheels to maintain their rotational speed and after aerodynamic drag, it's the largest force acting to slow us down when we're riding on a flat surface at speed. Bike tyres have loads of other important jobs to do. They need to provide an element of suspension and grip for balancing, turning and accelerating and braking. When discussing a tyre's grip, we're simply referring to the friction between the tyre surface and the surface that you're cycling on. Yet on top of all of that, we demand even more from our tyres. We want them to be lightweight, resistant to punctures, have low rolling resistance and do all of that for as little cost as possible. With so many different factors to consider, you can see why we have so many different options to choose from. And that's before even considering wheel size, tire width, compound if it's tubeless or needs an inner tube, tubular or maybe even hookless, and the surface it's intended to be ridden on. All pretty confusing stuff. With that out of the way, this is our typical road bike tyre. Its casing is made up from thin nylon or cotton fibres woven together and encased in a thin rubber layer. Then, down the central part of our tyre is the tread, and this is going to vary depending on the tyre's application. And then on the sides, we have the tyre bead. Older or more budget tyres will have a non-folding solid wire bead, but most modern tyres will have a flexible folding bead. Folding beads for tubeless tyres must resist stretch and are made from aramid or Kevlar fibres, similar to what's used in bulletproof vests. That's pretty cool. But what about different tyre fitment types? So how your tyres are actually held onto the wheels? You have tubular, clincher and tubeless. Traditionally for road racing, tubular tyres reign supreme. These use a casing sewn around an inner tube to create a complete tubular shape and must be glued to a tubular specific wheel rim. Clincher tyres are what are commonly fitted to most types of bikes. You have a casing with a formed bead on each side. This bead interlocks with the inner rim surface and has a separate inner tube installed. And then we have tubeless tyres, which look near identical to a clincher tyre, but do not require the use of an inner tube. They have a carefully shaped and constructed tyre bead that interlocks with the inner wheel rim surface with a tight tolerance to create an airtight seal. The tyre casing is slightly thicker than a clincher tyre and in most cases uses a liquid sealant to help prevent punctures and improve air retention over prolonged periods of time. On to tyre width now, and this is pretty simple to understand. It's simply how wide the tyre is in the millimetres once it's installed onto a wheel inflated to the correct pressure. The physical measured width can differ to what's stated on the box or sidewall of your tyre, and it's affected by the internal width of the wheel rim. The wider the inner rim, the wider it will make your tyre. With such a wide range of tyres and rim widths, and the fact that modern wheels are getting wider still, we now have a number of tyres and rims which are not compatible, so make sure you read up on what you buy next to ensure you have no issues. For casual and racing cyclists, 28mm wide road tyres have become commonplace, but typically the options range from 23 all the way to 32mm for normal road tyres, or 33mm up to 50mm for most tyres suitable for road and gravel bikes. 
In simple terms, a wider tyre will be more comfortable than a narrower one, but you will need to consider your tyre pressures relative to your tyre width. To some people, tyre pressure is a number that makes absolutely no sense at all. However, in the bike industry, we use just two units, PSI and bar. One bar is equal to 14.5 PSI, and one PSI is equal to 0.7 bar, or 0.0689476, for those of you who like to be a bit picky. Floor pumps and some mini pumps will have a gauge displaying one or both units. On the side of our tyres will almost always be the maximal pressure. This is not a recommended pressure, but think of it more as a safety measure to stop your tyres exploding off your wheels rather than a pressure for everyday use. The pressure you need to use will depend on your tyre width, your system weight, so that's you, your bike and all of your kit, the type of tyre you're using and the surface that you're riding on. Luckily there are loads of super helpful guides out there for almost every manufacturer and every tyre type out there to give you a good starting point. But the simple principles to go by are the wider the tyre, the lower the pressure, the heavier the rider, the higher the pressure, the bumpier the surface, the lower the pressure, the slippier the surface, the lower the pressure. When it comes to tyre size, for years we referred to our tyres as 700C, but the days of that actually being the size are long gone. Originally, the 700 referred to the outer diameter of our tyre, and the C part was the width. You even had 700 A, B, C and D to give you a few different options. The downside of this meant that as the tyre became wider and larger in volume, to keep the outer diameter the same, you needed to use different size wheels to match the 700 diameter, which I must say seems kind of bonkers now. Today though, what we refer to as 700C tyres use the ISO standard 5775, and means the tyre's inner bead measures 622mm in diameter, and the outer diameter, once inflated, will vary slightly depending on the width. If you look at your tyres, you'll see it stamped on the side somewhere. There's still a smaller size of tyre, the 650B, which is fitted to some extra small road bikes or some gravel bikes. The 650B tyre's inner bead measures 584mm. And then you have urban or commuting bikes, which might use a smaller steel 26 inch tyre. Yeah, sorry to introduce yet another measurement and number into the equation, but that's just the way of the bike industry. Onto your tyre casing next, and this has lots of important jobs to do. It needs to be strong, flexible, lightweight and resistant to punctures. Its construction is measured in TPI, the number of threads that cross through an inch squared of a single ply of tyre casing. A lower TPI count tends to give better puncture resistance, but it's heavier with more rubber used in its construction. A higher TPI count is more supple, offering a smoother, more comfortable ride while reducing the weight of the tyre. In addition to that, a tyre casing will often have a puncture protection belt layer in the centre just below the tread, which is this thicker central part of the tyre. It could be completely slick, have a subtle pattern like this tyre here, or have a more defined pattern like some gravel or urban tyres. On the road, the tread pattern has almost no impact on the tyre's grip. This is almost solely controlled by the rubber compound while much wider car or motorbike tyres have a deep channel to disperse standing water, there's no need on our narrow bike tyres. Head away from the smooth roads, and the tyre tread is going to be crucial to provide you with grip. The more pronounced the tread pattern, the more grip it will provide on loose or muddy surfaces, but at the cost of speed when on the road. Having just said tyre compound is mostly what affects the grip, you can understand why tyre manufacturers keep their rubber compounds a closely guarded secret. A harder, less flexible compound will resist wear and punctures, but provide little grip. A soft compound will provide maximal grip, but wear at a greater rate and be more susceptible to damage. Finding the perfect balance is far from easy, and it will also depend on the application and the temperature conditions that the tyre is intended for. And as such, winter tyres use a compound that remains supple in the cold, whereas a summer compound will be much firmer in the cold and provide less grip. 
One thing I haven't mentioned in detail just yet is hookless tyres, and that's because right now I just don't feel it's a technology that is that widely used just yet. But we do have a whole video dedicated just to hookless with all of the nerdy details, and there'll be a link to that in the description down below, or just search GCN hookless. So that covers off what I feel is some really important information to get you up to speed on bike tyres. As always, there could be loads more to discuss, but for everyday riding, I feel like that's all you need to know. Random question before I go, what company produces the most tyres? You can let me know in the comments section down below. And I've actually given you a little clue four minutes and two seconds into this video. Anyway, hope you found this video interesting, informative and helpful. If you have, please do give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments section down below. And don't forget, subscribe to GCN Tech for more interesting tech videos just like this one. Right, I'm out of here. See you later.